Thank you for joining us. We will begin in one minute to allow for the audience to join us on Facebook. So we will begin in one minute. All right, thank you so much for joining us today for our keynote address for Women's History Month. This is Women and Social Change, Edinburgh professor, Dr. Rhonda Matthews, and Edinburgh alumna, Dr. Jess Lavetto, who is also a faculty member at, uh, in the sociology department at Kent State Ashtabula. They're going to be talking about the current reality of women in America, touching on political and social activism, COVID-19's impact on the lives of women and other relevant topics. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rhonda Matthews. Excuse me, I was on mute. <laughs> that is the wrong way to end um, Women's History Month. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Dr. Rhonda Matthews and um, welcome to uh, our session that ends uh, uh, Edinburgh celebration of Women's Hi uh, History Month. Um, so uh, Dr. Jessica Levito and I are going to kind of have um, a freewheeling discussion about uh, women, um, power, uh, change, motherhood, uh, and what that means uh, for us all, what it signifies in terms of where we've come historically and culturally and in every other kind of way that we can think of, but also what it means um, for us when we think about where we're going. So um, we want to start this conversation by talking about motherhood. And here's one of the reasons we want to start by talking about motherhood. Um, because though not every um, person who is a woman uh, is going to become a mother, um, in our society, the, the cultural identity uh, around which motherhood is framed and around which we frame our own identities is very important. It's a strong cultural imperative. And so we really can't talk about the ways in which women can be in a society. We can't really talk about the ways in which women um, act and form their identities without at least acknowledging this kind of elephant in the room. So we wanna start by talking about um, issues of motherhood. So um, I'd like to start off by um, having Dr. Levito talk a little bit about the work um, that she's done um, uh, about motherhood uh, in her academic work. Okay, so let's get started. Go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Matthews. Um, what's interesting uh, is my work around motherhood really did start as a mother. Um, and I think that's an important salient point to, 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 to reference is that being a mother has shaped um, every aspect of who I am and my identity. Um, I'm a social psychologist by training. I earned my PhD in 2012 and my dissertation specifically looked at um, emotion and identity and mental health outcomes. And I, one of the things that I, I found interesting once the pandemic hit, cause I never, I mean, I've taught family courses. I have, um, you know, work, done some little bit of work around um, issues of, um, you know, family structure and institutional uh, structures. But my work around motherhood during the pandemic really took shape when I was invited to do a conversation similar to this um, over the summer. And that's where I was able to look at more of the data and to start collecting some of my own data related to motherhood in particular, how motherhood has um, been 
what's a good word, how the bomb on motherhood blew up during the pandemic, because mothers in particular um, have carried the brunt of the burden. So when we start thinking about um, time and the, the relative, you know, time, we, it's socially constructed, but as we know as mothers, you know, if we are doing our full-time job at home, so we're working mothers, we're doing our full-time job at home, but we're also doing um, the education. So we're managing virtual school. We are trying to manage our own, for me, obviously having students. Um, and, and we're trying to do all this and juggle all the balls. And I hate the word balance. I'll say that all the time. I hate the word balance, but it's because we set ourselves up for a false kind of utopia feeling that, that doesn't exist you know this idea that there's going to be balance i'm going to be able to spend x amount of hours at work and x amount of hours at home and everything's going to be wonderful and what the reality is showing is that we are just we're guilty no matter what we do no matter what choices we make wherever we spend our time we're feeling as though we're, we just don't have enough so my work in particular looks at identity and some of the things i want to explore and that i'm starting to explore is how um this idea of how much identity we spend in a role is a marker of salience identity salience and, and the argument is is the more that you, the more salient identity, the greater the impact's going to be um, when you're not fulfilling the expectations associated with that role. And that impact in general being you know, mental health outcomes or emotional distress. You know, we can talk about just feeling the, feeling the different emotions and feeling them uh, a little bit more um, intense, more frequent, longer duration, if we wanna get into you know, frequency, intensity, and duration of emotion, which is what I looked at in my dissertation. And so, you know, I, I've been listening a lot about some of the structural and the cultural issues around motherhood specifically, you know, and talking about these, this inability to fulfill these duties and, and, and then the burden that we carry and how unique to the United, the United States this experience is. Mm -hmm. um, and don't get me wrong, mothers in other countries are, are experiencing um, distress during all of this, but in the United States, we have a structure that's set up in a way that makes it more difficult for us to work. And it also puts much of that burden on the woman, on the mother. And it's cultural, even in egalitarian relationships. You know, I have a great relationship with my partner. He, su he supports not only me, but he does a lot around the house. He does a lot with the kids. But there's still this level of guilt that I am carrying when I can't give the kids a bath or wash their hair. And that's, mm -hmm. that's not right. That's not, we should not be carrying that. But in the United States, this individualistic culture, here we are saying, I have to do it all. And y'all, we can't do it at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, okay, so one of the things that I think is really interesting about, about not your, just your research, but your perspective on this, um, is that um, when you talk about it, when you talk about not only what you have found, but when you, when you talk about what the rest of the research indicates, um, people don't think about motherhood as work. Yeah. And, and to me, that is a major, a major cultural omission because it is work, right? I mean, it's some of the reasons that people become stay home parents, because that that balance thing that you're talking about, just does not work. It's a fancy, it's a fiction, uh, you know, and I, I don't, I'm not even really, uh, I don't really understand culturally. I mean, I do understand culturally how we got there, right? When women started to leave mm -hmm. the home to work, then you had to create some fiction about, um, you know, that it was good for you to leave the home, but you could also still do these things that you're supposed to be able to do inside the home. And you can have this balance and not feel guilty about it. I mean, turns out it's not true. But but the fact that people don't think about um, motherhood as work anymore, and I say anymore, because we used to, right? We used to, the, the foundational um, philosophy for the construction of what we now know as welfare, right, by um, by FDR's administration, right, was to give families a stipend so that the mother could stay home and do the important work of child rearing, right? And I don't think many people uh, understand that, but it's work. And so I think, uh, talk a little bit about what the research says about this about how people view motherhood in terms of um, the way that it taxes people. All right. Um, one of the things that you said that I kind of want to jump and I hope this maybe answers that question a little bit. Um, it's an activity that I've done in my sociology of family course where we um, 
we figure out what the value of a mother is. So we're, when we when we try to establish what would be the salary of a mother. Oh um, my goodness. Oh yeah, and it's and it's a fun it's a very is, fun activity. What is the current lottery jackpot? Right. Well, <laughs> the salary what about that much? Yeah. Right, because you know here we are, and 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 what are mothers doing? Well, oftentimes they're doing the so if we want to quantify it, we can because we live in a service economy, and now we you know we operate in this space where mm -hmm. everything a mother does, we can pay somebody to do. Right. I mean, we can pay a therapist. We can, we can pay a, 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 an Uber or a Lyft or a taxi cab. We can pay somebody to, to, to deliver our groceries, and mm -hmm. we do. Um, we can do all of these things. And once we start kind of itemizing the tasks, um, we realize that this, the, the work, the unpaid labor that goes into being a caregiver, a, a parent, right? And this is disproportionately impacting women and on mothers. And it's not to discredit the work that men and fathers and those caregivers are providing as well. And, you know, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's a, it's a high income. And it's one that because there's not a, a quantifiable number or I'm not getting that pay every week, um, we discredit it. We're in a capitalist economy, right? We're in a capitalist economy and in a capitalist economy, what do we do? We value things that provide money. Mm -hmm. And um, the economy of the unpaid labor, um, once we start dis, you know, dismantling it, looking at it item by item, we realize that mothers are essential they're cheap mm -hmm. and you know without them things just don't happen and mm -hmm. I think that we saw that a great deal more so in the past year um, I think people are paying attention over the past year um, and that's not to say that being you know and I'm gonna I'm play this uh, the other side of this point that being a caregiver doesn't have its rewards right that it doesn't have you know some intrinsic um motivating great things i'll never forget the one time my friend my friend i had I just have a wisdom teeth out and so i was a little bit dopey and um i was saying i've been a mother since i was 19. i mean i think i think i should come in with that you know we're talking about motherhood um i had my son when i was uh, tw 20 i was a sophomore um in 2000 and i have two girls um that are five and six that i had while i was on the tenure track it, it can and um you know i don't always choose the easy road but, but but one of the things that I, I'm laying there kind of recovering in this in this state and and, and one of my and my friend that was taking care of me, her best friend um, stopped because she just found out she was pregnant unexpectedly. And I was the only mother in the room and I was coming off of my, you know, coding, whatever induced -ness. And I wasn't sugarcoating it. I wasn't sugarcoating it at all. And I, you know, is, is motherhood rewarding? Well, <laughs> you know, he was six. He was six at the time. On the day. I just spent an hour in some in the car with him, right? Um, he's mm -hmm. 21, and and so, you know, yeah, yeah, but it's not all good. It's not all right. good. But we don't say that. But we should. Right. Right. We should. We owe it to each other to be honest about this work. Right. Well, and and one of the things that I find really, really uh, important about that is that um, is that hidden reality that people won't talk about that the thing that's important about that is that people will not talk about it and how can you make change when when no one is talking about the reality they make it look it? so easy they do well commercials make it look easy television you know i mean movie i mean that stuff's not real and right. and you know uh people are stepping into these roles um with these kind of fantasy fairy tale uh cultural uh, uh messages that have been presented to them and thinking oh well, well well i can do that and the fact of the matter is is that you know you can't one of the things that has happened during this last year is that we've seen a spike in anxiety and other forms of mental illness, depression, particularly in mothers, right? And and one of the reasons I will I will not put a fine point on this. You can't get away from your family, right? There was a, there was an there's been an entire year when we have been unable to escape, yes. right? None of us have been able to escape, and so it's been um, it's been damaging. Um, in more ways than just the the untold work of motherhood has been, yeah. and so so here's my question. In keeping with the the discussion about um, social change, so so what's the catalyst for change here? 
other than a lot of pissed off mothers? Um, well, I mean, you know, we're going to go on straight. A lot of social change starts with yep. pissed off people. We know that. We know that deprivation theory is mm -hmm. one of the leading um, theoretical uh, positions when we talk about why social movements start. Yep. So, I mean, if it takes some pissed off mamas to do some stuff, well, I think the conversations coming home too, because I think the men, um, you know, they were home too, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of men were home too. And they were saying, oh, shit. <laughs> like that's how that gets done. You know, right. and, 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 <laughs> oh my, they have, you know, and it's the truth because, it, you know, they, there, there is some of this, you know, and, and, and I'm gonna feel bad if Nick watches this and he might, but, you know, like my partner helps me a lot, but I remember I would go, I'd go hide in the office and I, I'd be coming home and he'd tell me everything he was doing at the house, which I appreciated. And mm -hmm. I love him for doing that work. But I was like, you want what? a cookie? Well, you know, or clean underwear, but he did, he does, he does the laundry and I appreciate yeah. that. He does. And I'm going to say over the past, over the past, probably four years, he's does the bulk of the domestic labor. He does. Right. He really does. But it just, it strikes me as when we start going through the list, because I remember doing it and I was just like, just get it done. Like I, I didn't report. Well, and then, but then when you start again, it's itemizing it like in a capitalist economy. And so as soon as we start itemizing it, it has more value, you know, mm -hmm. and so this exchange, look, I did this, 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 and this, this, and I'm like, Ugh, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I did it without giving a report about it. Right, right. And, and so, so men and, seeing helps. Men seeing right, it does help. Yeah. Right. But I, I think I, I, one of the reasons I think that we're ripe for social change um, is because of that kind, those kinds of interactions, which have been magnified mm -hmm. um, by uh, you know, us being locked up uh, in quarantine. What's a better way to say? <laughs> no, nah, it's been locked up. Locked up. It's, you know it's, what been, I mean? it's been locked up. It's okay. I think okay. so. All right. I mean, well, it, we're starting to see some freedom. Yeah. Glimpses of freedom. Right. Um, and, and I think that will help, but we can't forget. And, and, the, and the impact's not going away, right, Rhonda? I mean, that's that's the tr truth of the matter. The impact of COVID, the, the way it set women and mothers back, it's not going away. And mm -hmm. and so how we regroup and how we start thinking about the progress and moving, I know that's that's gonna, that's coming later in the talk here, mm -hmm. uh, but, but, but we have to, even if we get out of this, we can't forget about it. We can't forget about having the discussions of how to make it better. How mm -hmm. can we make policy and how can we make change? And we have to keep the anger, keep that emotion kind of, but make mm -hmm. it action-based, right? How do we take that and make it movements? I, I think that that is, I think that that is spot on. Um, and the word that you said just now um, that, that, that takes me on a tangent is policy, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because I don't think that any any social change um, uh, happens um, without the result. No, wait a minute. Let me see. Let me let me say this in a in a better way than I was going to say it. The result of social change is policy, right? Because mm -hmm. because I I think that um, I think that for most people um, they think about policy like law. You know, um, you know, let other p other types of pieces of legislation, resolutions, things like that. You know, executive orders, all the people think that that um, is the harbinger of social change. That that precedes social change, mm -hmm. when in fact the opposite is true. Right? Social change occurs um, and is then followed by policy. So when we think about change and specifically when we think about uh social change as it pertains to women i want to talk about some of the ways that women are coalescing right in this present moment um, to work for effective change so one of the um one of the things i think about uh often i you know because again we've been locked up we haven't you know we've had a whole lot of opportunity to read watch tv and unless, kind of, unless you have young children uh, that's true. You're right. Because I don't, because I don't have young children. Right. Um, There's a difference. Yeah. Mine is 21, just like yours. So, yes. um, you know, so, so, but, but one of the things I have find, found myself doing um, is what I normally do, but magnify, which is to cogitate upon the social, um, the social uh, interactions that we're having. And one of the things that has been consistent over this last year, um, well, it's been highlighted over this last year. It's been consistent across, 
you know, across um, centuries, but is the role of women um, in the coalescence of people in order to make change. So I think about all of the, the social movements uh, that have been led by women. Um, I think about um, uh, a lot of the political work um, that has been led by women. And, when, and I shouldn't just say women because some of, some of the leaders of some of these uh, efforts at change are actually um, girls, right? Mm -hmm. Um, if you um, think about uh, Greta Thunberg, you know, so, so I want to talk about the ways in which women coalesce um, in order to construct effective change. So what are some of your thoughts about this? Because I know you do some political work um, in your own community. Well, yeah, this is the, this is one where I know, I know that, um, you ha you might have better insight, but what I have seen um, specifically in in part to some of the, um, the I'm trying to sidestep around this a little bit the the um, the ist policies of maybe the previous administration without you know saying uh -huh. too much there, but I want to you know there but there were there was some some policies that were detrimental to um you know women women of color um and to um you know under to not white men and and in and, 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 and like again i don't want it to make it hostile about that but in those in seeing some of the policies that were kind of just countered to the progress that women in particular and even young women right so mm -hmm. young women there for a while you're teaching these classes and women and, and, and young women are like we're there we got it we got we got everything we want we don't need any more feminism is not for me and then all of a sudden 2016 rolls around and some of these young women are like hold up uh -huh. wait, wait a minute you, i mean they don't they don't need cemented? to identify yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> they didn't have to identify as a feminist, but their actions all of a sudden became feminist. It yeah. was young women and it was old women. And it was a lot, it was a lot of retired teachers. I know that's going to sound weird, mm -hmm. um, but you know, I saw a lot of women and a lot of women that were retired teachers in my community anyway, that mm -hmm. were stepping out and saying, you know, I want to retire, but what the hell is going on and oh. what's going on for the next generation? We can't let this happen. That um, that sign that I kept seeing over and over and over and over again, um, you know, in in slightly different forms, but it was all basically, what you mean I got to do this again? Mm -hmm. We already did this. Why mm -hmm. are we doing it um, again? And and what has been um, what has been amazing to me um, is the ways that women have coalesced across social the lines of social characteristics right so so like you know you, you know we were at um we were at the first women's march right mm -hmm. yes we um, were. Yeah. and there were all kinds of people there yes, right but mm -hmm. then after the women's march you know there 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 came more discussions about okay so what are the ways in which we have to look at change as women but in an intersectional way right are we thinking about um socioeconomic class when we're talking about women because that makes a difference mm -hmm. are we thinking about race and ethnic identity when we're talking about women are we thinking about immigration status are we thinking about um physical ability are we mm -hmm. thinking about mental disability what you know and so and so tw since 2016, I think we have, I would say almost every month, right, seen more progress forward. Um, well, maybe forward is the wrong word. I mean, it's the, it's the right description, mm -hmm. but I think a better word is march towards inclusion, right? We want to get as many people in here because now is the time to do it. And, and I have found that remarkable. I have found it remarkable that, that we have finally gotten to a point where we can have these discussions in circles of women mm -hmm. um, in which we're talking about feminism, but we're also talking about it in terms of you know, all of those social characteristics, age and, you know, uh, gender identity. And I mean, just on and on. And that has been real and uh, it's been, it's been persistent. It's been consistent. And I think that it's the thing that is going to continue to propel us forward. Mm -hmm. um, 
because I think people have realized that there's no other way to do it, right? right. You, you're either going to have to do the whole thing um, or it's never going to get done, right? We because it's in the, the past, we've left people out. We have, right? In we, the past, we've just ignored groups, right? Right. So if, if we're not going to all reach, um, reach the mountaintop together, then there's, you know, then what are we doing? And, and that is a new tone. That's a new shift. Um, do you think that has to do with, I, I question, so my question, do you think that has to do with um, just a more, I, I watch what I say here, inclusive younger generation, a yeah. younger generation is just like got no time for this shit. Like what are, what yeah. is going on? Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. It really is. And I, you know, I don't mean to besmirch the good name of any old people. Cause you know, I'm an old, <laughs> um, I don't. But I think, and, and don't get me wrong, I, it's not like young people kind of came to this on their own. They have had the benefit uh, of a lot of years of the kinds of research that people in our field have done, right? Yeah. We know so much more now yeah. um, than we have ever known. So for instance, um, I was having a conversation, I cannot remember who this was, but I was having a conversation about a, a conversation about LGBTQI rights, right? Um, and how rapidly that movement um, has, uh, has um, progressed, right? Well, you know, people who began the, uh, the um, who began in earnest, you know, the kind of um, institutional social movement for LGBTQI rights um, had the benefit of, of learning the tactics of the civil rights movement. Yep. Same thing with the disability rights movement and yep. on and on and on, right? So there was a, a foundation laid that people built upon. So that's one, that's one um, factor. But the other factor is that we know so much more now about gender, gender identity, about, uh, about sex, you know, biology, genetics. We know so much more now um, than we have ever known. And they have the benefit of that. Right. Yeah. So so people my age and older, you know, have been um, socialized into this binary system of gender and to this binary system of sexual identity and orientation. And so we're just kind of locked into that. So when the information is thrown, you know, at a whole bunch of people who are older, they're like, mm -mm, mm -mm, it's not what I was taught. Don't yeah. tell me that. Right. But but younger people are like, oh that's what's been going on mm -hmm. right and so so they're much more open as a result of this information because it's there right, right. It's, it's been taught to them and so that is, i think that and that's not just about um it's not just about um lgbtqi rights it's about everything and so that's their impetus right. for you know, you can't make, you can't do research and find out all these new things and facts and all of this stuff and then tell us we can't act on it. What is wrong with you? Right. Which, and you know, that that's a good point. I got, <laughs> I got to say, it's the best point, right? You move forward with knowledge uh, and we've given that to them and that is precisely what they're doing. And you know, some people are mad. Well, and they're stepping up. I mean, yeah. I think, I think, I think about June. And the Black Lives Matter yes. movement, and yeah. and and just um, the representation, and you know that was, I, I I know I've said this to you before. That was probably the most alive I felt this previous year because this yeah. year of being, you know, I got out, I registered voters in, in an mm -hmm. event. That's my, my activism. You know, what, what what are you comfortable with in your level of activism? Like I will say, I want it to all come crumbling down, and then I'm out there saying. You want to register to vote or you register yeah. to vote? Yeah, register? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because that is fundamentally right. You know, it shifts into this, 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 this kind of bringing our political power to the front. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that, but you know, there's so many ways that social change happens and, and there are so many different ways to be part of a, a resistance or a movement. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we just need to find where we're comfortable mm -hmm. and go from there. You know, I, I, I think I said one time I was badass or my son made a badass cardigan wearing because I was wearing my, you know, badass, but I'm out there and that's what I'm going to do. But I need other folks to come along with me that are right. from those groups, right? Because the, as long as people can see themselves too, and, and I'm being like middle-aged white lady, I need support, you know, we need to work together. I'm gonna do what yeah. I can and everybody's gonna pitch in and we're gonna register people to vote. <laughs> but, but, you know, I think that, that, I think that one of the things that happens with women 
um, and it is that um, is that because we are already members of a of a largely oppressed group, mm-hmm. you know, regardless as to what other social characteristics we have, um, that it is in fact easier for us to coalesce, right? To to work together in spite of that stereotype of, about women being you know in competition with one another right when push comes to shove w- women know how to coalesce across age lines across mm-hmm. gender lines you know across socioeconomic lines across ethnic lines we we know how to do that um, and oddly enough um, the, the, the gendered socialization that we have, that's been pushed on us our whole lives actually is a benefit in this, um, in this instance, right? We know how to connect with other people. And so, and so I think that that's been um, the part of the power of social change that has been directly, um, I think solely um, and directly uh, made possible by women, you know, women engaging in processes of social change. I, and I think that that's absolutely um, important. So well, one of the, oh, go ahead. Just one, I just want to share, like, one of the things I read kind of in, 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 in looking at statistics related to the talk this afternoon or this evening is um, women mentors, right? Mm-hmm. And the importance of that mentorship and that mm-hmm. actually there is, you know, even in the corporate world, evidence of stronger mentorship and more importance in that mentorship role um, for women with other women than, than with men with men or men with women. And I thought that was very interesting um, right. as I sit in the basement of, you know, a, a colleague and talking to you who has served as a mentor for about 20 years for me. So, well, but, but you see that's, I, and I think that's the, that is the um, that is the example. That's because mm-hmm. that is a demonstration of not only um, women's abil- ability to coalesce and make change. Um, it's it's about change both on a micro level, yeah. right, a personal yeah. level, but it's also about change on a macro level. So it works whether you're talking about. Um, guiding another young woman into uh, an area uh, that she maybe didn't think that she could do, Mm -hmm. or being a part of a larger movement to get policy changed. And you you need both, right? You need both. You got to have both. But, but But it works in the same way. Yeah. It was the, the, the importance of role model, and actually Kate, um, Caitlin Collins. So this is the, the audio book that I've been listening to that, that I was told, told you uh, she's done the work. It's um, the book she wrote was uh, making motherhood work. And, and one of the things that she, she talks about in a podcast that I was listening to was about, um, you know, the need for us to role model in um, so, so talking about policy change within the workplace. So now we're getting to a meso level here mm-hmm. talking about policy change at the meso level, but then not stopping there. So when your employer has kind of implemented these like ways of, um, you know, for mothers to be able to balance things and for, you know, flexible work arrangements and, and, and all the things that we're asking for, that's great for your employer, but don't stop there. Organizations mm-hmm. need to then kind of uh, come together. So you got mm-hmm. some cultural shifting happening at the, at the micro level, but for those cultural shifts to really become structural changes, we've got to continue we can't just stop when it's our organization right right well because the organization whatever it is um is is a key so now we we have to tie it back to um the ways in which women work right Mm -hmm. um uh, outside of the home um Mm -hmm. so i yeah so i think that all of those things uh, are absolutely connected so um the so the last thing that I want to talk about um, is um, I want to talk well not the last thing maybe the second to the last thing uh, maybe they're connected so um, so I want to talk about the ways in which we've seen um, political shifts um, that have been led by women. Um, and then maybe I, I think later want to dovetail into, um, if we have time, dovetail into a uh, discussion about um, the ways in which the pandemic has, has affected the, the politics of it all. Okay, mm-hmm. so, um, so you know, I've always been, um, been keenly aware and vastly interested in um, the, the role of women in politics. Um, you know that we have not reached parity in terms of representation. 
um, that that we are uh, that at the especially at the federal level, but actually the number is pretty similar um, across all different levels of politics. So from from municipal representation all the way up to federal level, women represent somewhere between um, 23 and uh, 24 percent. Um, of the elected officials in, in any, um, generally speaking, in any given body. Now, that seems like a s small number. I mean, that's, there, there are, what, 338 million people in the United States. Roughly 252% of those people are women. 25% uh, represent, or close to 25% representation doesn't seem like a whole lot. Um, it, and it's not, I don't even know why, <laughs> uh, you know, it's not, it, it just isn't, you know, by no standard is that a lot of people, but here's the thing, it's better than what it has been, Yep. right? right. This is the best it's ever been. Yep. Um, and so I think a lot about what the, the question, we, we talked about this before, the question was posed to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you know, um, what would it take to reach parity, gender parity on the Supreme Court? And she said, when there are nine women justices. And the, the person who asked her the question was, you know, you, I heard an audible gasp, uh, right? Not a, uh, they didn't say, uh, that's what I heard, but I did hear the gasp though, yeah. you know, because the person had never thought about that before. Right. We, Ooh, nine women justices. For just for a couple nine. hundred years, right? Just for 200 right. years. And then we could go back. That is what she said, right? Because, because her response to the, to the person who posed the question was, well, you know, well, there have been nine male justices forever. Why is the, the idea of nine women sitting on the highest court in the land um, uh, shocking, right? And it is. And we know why it is because gender and cuz socialization and cuz patriarchy right we know that <laughs> but we've seen active change being made in the political sphere by women mm -hmm. right um and right now black women are leading the charge oh yeah right? uh we have uh, a black woman as the vice president of the united states she's also southeastern right but mm -hmm. She yep. is, she is Southeastern, I'm sorry, South Asian, but she's the, she's the vice president, right? And, and I will tell you, um, my mother and I have had these conversations before when Barack Obama was elected, she was like, I, she's, she was convinced they're not going to let him live. They're not going to, they're not going to, he's not going to be it. They're not going to let him live. Right. Um, she just she just did not believe it in that. And then every day after inauguration was another day for wow. Right. So didn't think she'd see it now, you know, uh, Kamala Harris. So. Yeah. So then that's at the federal level. So then we've got all of these things happening at the state level that are being led by women. So not just women organizers, community organizers, but more women have run for office since 2016 than we have ever seen, right? More women across the board. Um, I don't know what the numbers are for this um, election cycle because um, the deadlines uh, uh, have just passed for you know for people to submit their petitions, but I suspect that that number is going to be higher than ever. Um, so so one of the things that I find striking in this moment, um, I, I will and I will admit that this moment is terrifying for me. It it's terrifying. Um, there is some really bad shit that's happening in this country right now that terrifies me. Um, but there is so much um, on the horizon. Mm -hmm. When I think about social change and almost all of that is being led by women. So I kind of want to talk about power and women's efforts to organize and, and what that means or what we think it means because, you know, we don't have a crystal ball, um, but what we think it means writ large. 
What do you think it means? I think it's going to be better for everyone, yeah. right? You know, this isn't, this isn't, and I, and I, my son won't be watching this. But I, I can, I can pretty much, but who knows, maybe, he, maybe he's sneaking and watching my, 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 my girl power stuff. Um, <laughs> That's what he said. He was in the car. It was so nice to have an hour and a half with him, you know, in a car and talking, but girl power, girl power means boys don't have power. Everybody should just be equal, says the boy with all the privilege. Yeah. Yeah. And I said that, and then he didn't like that. Um, yeah. 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 But I think that, you know, this idea, you know, the more that we are, well, two things, right? There's, there's, and there's two, two possible, or probably more than two um, potential ways this can turn out. Right. Um, you know, we, we've seen what's happened with the pandemic. We've seen what's happened with women leaving the workforce disproportionately and having more of a negative impact on women in particular. But, you know, so so and, and, and a lot of scholars and people are talking about this impact is going to this one stings. This is putting women back. So like, um, you know, as far as progress, as far as women's equity and equality, it, it, it's pushing it's putting us back. So there's going to be some, some of that's going on, but then there's also this, this backlash, you know, this backlash of, of that you, anytime there's forward progress in any movement, there is a swift and, and quick backlash. And we saw that, I believe we saw that with the election of, of, of Trump. And I, and I, and I, I mean, we did, we saw, we saw the, as a backlash or, you know, as, as it was going to white lash. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so what my fear, you know, this one, there's this one kind of outcome is that um, it harms us. Mm -hmm. It harms, it harms progress. It harms, it, you know, that women coalescing, um, that there's going to be attempts to divide. Um, and, 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 and because, you know, there's a lot of research on that too. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. while I like to think that people that would be um, against a lot of these type of progressions would be, um, you know, not smart. Um, they are, and they're just mm -hmm. as smart and they're, and they're in positions of power to utilize mm -hmm. that same research and mm -hmm. use those for, for evil, not good. So that, that's mm -hmm. kind of the one thing. But then, you know, this other is this idea that, you know, we're seeing a paradigm shift we're seeing a movement that is, uh, it's a culture. It's not just a, in pockets of, of pockets, of, you know, wealthy folks. It's, 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 it's people are kind of coming and coming together. And I see this as progress for, um, you know, my girls, mm -hmm. right. My girls that are five and six, that, 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 that these conversations that they sure as hell, hopefully aren't going to be holding that same sign. Yeah. You know, in, 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 in 20 years from now, but they, they might be. Mm -hmm. Um, but I really, I really hope not, but I, I think, I think we're kind of at one of those points where it, it could go either or some variation. I, I, I tend to agree. I think we, I think that we are at an inflection point. Um, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to say this and I don't know that I'm right about it, but I think I am, um, unparalleled in the history uh, of social change in the country. I, I do think that we are. And I, and I also think that that's one of the reasons that I think it's so scary, right? Because, you know, on, uh, you know, around this corner is potentially real change and, um, that it's thrilling. It's mm -hmm. absolutely thrilling. Um, and, and the other thing that is just absolutely thrilling about it to me is that it is largely being led by women, right? And that young women are a part of that, which means that when I die, there will still be a whole, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. cadre of young women behind you know, who are going to be uh, m continuing to, to move um, things forward. I, I, I think, I think we get some young men too. I think that my mom's generation in particular raised better men. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. why I can, you know, have a relationship in the, in, in it more egalitarian. Uh -huh. And I, and I think that, and I want to think that I've raised, uh, you know, a, a young man that that's a better man and that, mm -hmm. that, that, that keeps going. So so if, if we're raising girls, that, that it, we're also raising these boys too, and, and, and they're going to benefit. You know, that's true. Um, and, and I don't, I don't, I do think about it, but I think more about young women because I, you know, my daughter is a young woman. Um, and so, but I think you're absolutely right. Also, you know, no major change um, occurs without large swaths of of, uh, of any population. But in terms of who leads, um, yes. I, I am I am seeing young women, 
right? Yeah, that's absolutely. that's who I'm seeing. I mean, I'm. It's not that young men aren't there, but yeah. but young women. And are in some ways, that should be right. In some ways, that's that's the natural. In some ways, that absolutely should. And 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 black women in particular, mm-hmm. you know, black women in particular, we're looking at especially around voting rights and yeah. advocacy and yeah. and those types of things. I mean, those there there's power in the vote, and yep. that is where we see a lot a lot of movement that that's given me hope. I mean, well, it's a participatory democracy, right? And in a participatory democracy, uh, we're all supposed to participate. And so, um, and and with that as the 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 foundation from which we leap, I think that we can look at um, uh, the future of women um, uh, as leaders, right? As harbinger, not harbingers, as uh, creators of social change. Um, as uh, not just powerful in and of themselves, but gaining access to mm-hmm. institutional power. Yep. And we are, and we know that that is that is where where the real change happens. You got to get in the room. You got to get in. The, the you got to get in the room. And it's 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 interesting. I'm 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 here, and this is one of the things that. Um, you know, I, I'm in a colleague's house that's three hours away from my own house. So as far as where is here, um, because of a lot of complex things but, but that led me here oh, uh, really? impromptu that weren't good now. Uh, but but one of the things I've sat, I sat in a meeting with this woman in particular, um, and it was it was a, an advisory committee meeting, right? So we're, I'm now I'm now tenured. I'm now in a position where you know I I'm reading and, and, and issuing ballots on on folks and and whether or not their their work is is good enough. But but to get into the room, to get into the table, and to advocate for other folks, and to um, you know, not, and this isn't necessarily you know making it unequal. No, this is having a seat at the table to look through a different lens and a different perspective and the importance of diversity in those chambers, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's imperative. And, and the reason I bring up uh, my colleague is, is because I was in this committee and I saw her advocate and I was like, <gasps> and that was the best thing she could have done for me because mm-hmm. it wasn't advocating for me, but she was modeling. She exactly. was modeling how that happens. She, she, you know, she, she gets this position and, and you want to talk about, and that's where the mentorship and that's the importance of mentorship right now. And that's the importance of my relationship with you. And, and it is, is okay. And, and Michelle Obama talks about this too. You know, you mm-hmm. get into these positions, but you don't shut that door. You get into these positions and then you do you you advocate, you role model, you mentor. It's an extra burden. It's just one more damn thing we got to carry around. Mm-hmm. But you do that and you do that for those next generation. Right. Because because that is the path. Yep. That's the path um, to social change. And I think it's the path that, to social change that women do best, quite honestly, right? Um, making, coalescing and making those connections. And sometimes the connections are lateral, right? You know, you, you connect with people who are on your same level. Um, sometimes those connections are mentor-based, right? Where you are, you know, um, um, putting your hand out to help somebody else. Here, let me guide mm-hmm. you um, on this process, and and I think that that's important. And I I am uh, I am glad, I'm so glad um, to actually see it in action. Rather than we, you know, I've been studying this stuff for a very long time. It is another thing entirely to actually see it manifest. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad about that. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's so stupid. we've been talking for about 50 minutes. Um, so I want to give you an opportunity to um, to say something in closing that you'd like for um, people to hear about women in change, and then I'll do the same. Okay. As far as uh, some of my last words, I think that um, for if we look if we look to the past for any recollection of where we're going, right? So the past is going to give us some indication of of where we go. Um, we are not going to get there alone. And, and when we look at the intersections and the collaborations across is, is Rhonda, uh, the, the age and um, ability and, and sexual identity and gender and sex and all of these things, once we start seeing that we're interconnected and that the, the more advocacy we can have to support one another at the micro level and mm-hmm. then to push for change at the, at the macro level and the structural level, um, that is how 
progress will be made. We will have a more egalitarian, more equitable. Um, and this isn't trying to give anybody, oh, girl power, well, girl power, I'm a little girl power. But this is to say that if, if, if we give girls an equitable and an equal chance to that power, then what we're going to see is just better opportunities for, 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 for men and for all. So um, the idea isn't necessarily girl power feminist. Let's like, you know, get rid of all the men though. No, I'm kidding. I mean, well, there's those moments, <laughs> those moments. Um, and I'm thinking of my friends that call me and they're like, bah! because they have had to come up against, uh, you know, barrier after barrier after barrier of being a young woman in the classroom, right? You know, this, uh, does she have credibility? No, what's she doing in the front of her? Like, so there's, there's a little bit of agitation and anger inside of me. And I understand that. But they think that once we get into these positions, we gotta we gotta hold each other up and and not forget how we got here because we definitely didn't get here alone. Absolutely, and I um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And I and I think that the succinct way to to say this is that um, as go women, so go the nation, right? All of our statistics all of the statistics, um, whether it's in the United States or whether it's in um, any other country, whether it's a developed nation or whether it's an undeveloped nation. Um, what we know is that when women and girls do better mm -hmm. on all accounts, economic, educational, um, medical, uh, all of it, right? When, when girls and women do better, everyone does better. The, the, the stats are unassailable, right? And so when I think about women and power and change, that's what I think that, you know, as go women, so go the nation. So I wanna thank you for spending some time to meet with me today in discussion about women and po power and policy and social change. Um, I think it's a good way to cap off um, Women's History Month, um, to leave us thinking not just about uh, where we have been, I mean, where we were, right? What the history is, but, um, but where we're going, which is, which is equally as important. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.